Okay, so as we will see in the later lectures when we talk about quantum algorithms, we will see that quantum operations don't have any control mechanism. But a very useful and very practical gate serves a similar purpose. It's called controlled NOT gate. A controlled NOT gate has two inputs and two outputs. So since we cannot measure the computation um, and obtain information about the quantum system without breaking the superposition, we still need to, we still want to have some control structures in quantum algorithms. Okay? But this control structure will not interfere with our uh, computation. So C not gate, the controlled not gate, is defined in the following manner. So we have two inputs, cat x and cat y. And then we take the C not, x being the control bit and y being the target bit. And the output is x and x, x or y. So this is simply x or operation. Okay. So the top input is the control bit. It controls the output. And it basically inverts the second input only when the control bit is 1. Okay, so if, if x is equal to 0, then, well, y remains the same. But otherwise, if x is equal to 1, then it flips y. Okay, 0 becomes 1 and 1 becomes 0. So C not gate essentially takes 2 qubit input and it maps to x, x, x or y. Okay. The truth table can be written as so Let's write x and y in two columns and c not x y so in zero zero our control bit is zero so we're gonna do nothing with y so output is zero zero in this case if the input is zero one still the control bit is zero so we're gonna do nothing with y if we have one zero, then we're going to flip the second qubit. Okay, so this becomes one one. On input one one, the output is one zero. So th then let's write the matrix representation of C naught. So this means that on if we are given the basis state zero zero, the output will be zero zero, right? So in this case, for example, if we are given the basis state 1, 0, this will be mapped to the basis state 1, 1. Okay, so we have a four-dimensional uh, vector space because we have two qubits. So then the matrix representation of C0 will be, so on input 0, 0, this will map to 0, 0. So that is one zero 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 vector. On input 0, 1, the output is zero one, so zero one is zero one zero zero. On input one zero, the output is one one, and one one is represented by the column vector zero 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 one. On input one one, the output is one zero, so that's 
zero zero one zero. Okay. So now clearly C naught transformation is unitary. Hence, it's reversible, and in fact, C naught is its own inverse. Okay, so if we apply uh, the C naught on the same vector again, then we get the original vector. So C naught of C naught, let's say a b. Oh, let's denote this by the ket notation. Then the output is a, b, okay? All right. So this is, very, this is very practical gates in quantum computations and it's widely used in many algorithms as we shall see. So there's another reversible gate called a Toffoli gate, okay? Foley gate. So this is a universal and reversible gate. So a universal reversible classical gate. Universal means that it could simulate any other classical gate and reversible in the sense that we can you know recover the input from the output. Okay so since it's universal with Toffoli gates, we can simulate any non-reversible classical gate, okay? So Toffoli gate is, its algebraic uh, definition is, so it has three inputs, x1, x2, x3. And the first input is, uh, the first output is x1, the second output is x2, and the third output is x1 times x2 plus x3. So this is the algebraic uh, notation. So in other words, it takes three inputs, cat x, cat y, cat z. The first two outputs are the same with the inputs. The third output is Z X or X times Y. Okay. Now we can simulate any classical gate with Toffoli gates. Um, in a previous lecture, I gave um, how we could simulate the AND gate using reversible gates, um, actually using Toffoli gates. The example I gave was uh, uh, it used Toffoli gates. So if we could, if, if we give um, Z zero, then T X one X two zero is simply equal to X one X two and the output, third output is x1 times x, so it simulates end. Right. And how do we simulate or? Well, we can, or is basically the negation of, so x1 or x2. Well, this is logically equivalent to the negation of, negation of x1 and x2, right? So solely by using not and end gate, we could uh, simulate or gates. Since we could reversibly simulate end gate using Toffoli gates, we could also simulate or gates. Okay, so that means in principle, classical computation can be solely made reversible. Okay, so hence we could um, 
we could simulate any classical computation uh, in quantum computation. Okay. Now, but these are not quantum exclusive gates. So C naught and Toffoli gates are really classical gates. Okay, but we can still use them in quantum computation because they're um, reversible. But there is one important uh, exclusive gate for quantum computation, and one of the exclusive gates is called the Hadamard transformation. All right, so Hadamard transformation is a single qubit gate, okay? But it can be extended for n qubit systems. I will show that later on. So we usually denote Hadamard transformation by H, okay? And it's simply the it's simply defined by the matrix 1 over square root 2 1 1 1 minus 1. So let's see what this does. So essentially, Hadamard transformation creates a superposition of basis states. Okay. So when we apply H on the basis state 0, well, what we get is, so Hadamard's matrix is 1 over square root 2 minus 1 over square root 2. And then we have cat 0, which is, 1, 0. So this is equal to 1 over square root 2, 0, plus 1 over square root 2, 1. And that's equal to 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2 matrix, or a vector. Okay, so verify that Hadamard transformation is unitary, okay, and it's actually its own inverse. Okay, so if we apply it twice, we get the original inputs. So Hadamard transformation is certainly reversible. Okay. All right, so um, geometrically speaking, in fact, what it does is that it rotates the vector space around the uh, pi over 8 axis. So let me draw the two-dimensional space. Suppose that this axis represents cat1 and this axis represents cat0. So now this um, this vector with an angle of pi over 4, this is the plus vector. All right, so this is 1 over square root 2, 0 plus 1 over square root 2, 1. And suppose that this is minus, cat minus. This is exactly the same except that the phase is minus. And in fact, notice that h1 is equal to cat minus. Okay, all right, so let's draw the pi over 8 axis. So suppose that this is a pi over 8 axis. Okay, so really what it does is that Hadamard of 0 will be a reflection around the pi over 8 axis, right? Because if, if if the input is cat zero, then the output will be cat plus. So it takes a reflection around pi over eight. If the input is cat one, then we take the we take a rotation around the pi over eight axis again. So and then the output will be cat minus. Okay. If the input is cat minus, so the Hadamard gate is reversible. We apply the H transformation on 
cat minus and then we get uh, cat one back again. Okay, so this is the geometric interpretation. And this is quantum exclusive. So Hadamard transformation is a quantum exclusive gate. Okay, and other one bit important gates are called Pauli gates. And so there are three Pauli gates, x, these are one qubit gates, x is 0, 1, 1, 0. This is actually the not gates, right? And y is 0, i, minus i, 0. And z is the gate, it's the face flip gate, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. So these gates actually correspond to rotations around the x, y, z axis in the blosphere. Okay, so Pauli gates rotate blosphere um, exactly 180 degrees about the x, y, z axis respectively. Okay, so the x gate rotates the blosphere around the x axis 180 degrees or pi radian. Z gate, it's a, it's a phase flip gate, so it flips the sign, the relative sign, the relative phase of the qubit and it rotates the blosphere around the z axis 180 degrees and similarly for the y gate okay but sometimes um, we may want to turn the vector not by uh, 180 degrees around some axis but just about uh, let's say theta degrees along a particular direction okay and when this idea is applied for the z-gate, then we obtain a transformation called phase shift. Okay, phase shift. So these are all rotations in the blosphere. At least we could imagine that there are rotations in the blosphere uh, about 180 degrees. Okay. And y and z could be called a phase flip gate, phase flip. But if we want to, um, if we want to rotate the vector just about theta degrees, let's say theta is, is uh, for some real number, okay, theta between zero and one, let's say, um, then we obtain a phase shift gate. A phase shift gate could be denoted by r theta, okay, and it's equal to 1, 0, 0 with the complex coefficient e to the i theta, right, because a phase essentially it's just a complex number in the exponential form and by varying theta we could obtain different phase values, okay, so theta is a real numbers. Okay, so now, but what if we want to apply the Hadamard transformation on two qubits, uh, on a two qubit system? If we have two qubits, x, y, how can we apply Hadamard transformation on the system? Well, we can take the tensor product of two ten of two Hadamard transformations. So then we could apply H2, which is equal to H tensor H. Okay, so if we want to apply Hadamard transformation on both X and Y, we could just write, you know, H tensor H, and we apply this to 
to on, on the two qubit system x, y. Okay. And okay, so but what happens if we what if we want to apply not gates on the first qubit and Hadamard transformation on the second qubit? Well in that case we will we have to apply the transformation x tensor h. Right? So this applies not gates on x and Hadamard on y. There are also times that we want to apply nothing on the first qubit or the second qubit. So s suppose that we don't want to do anything with y, but we just want to apply the Hadamard transformation on the first qubit. What we do is that we apply the identity matrix. Okay, so if we want to apply the Hadamard transformation on the first qubit and do nothing with the second qubit, we just apply the operation H tensor I. Okay, so this applies h on the first qubit, that is x, and does nothing on y. Okay, so now that we've introduced um, all the necessary gates. So these Pauli gates are called uh, universal gates actually for quantum computation. Okay, so we can define any um, any matrix, any transformation using the Pauli gates and the Hadamard transformation. Okay, so all together they are universal. All right, so we spoke um, a few things about Bell states. Okay, in the previous lectures. So how do we create one? How do we create a Bell state? Okay, so let's look at that. Well, to create a Bell state, all we need is just the Hadamard transformation and a C0 transformation. Okay. Now, suppose that our... So we're going to create a 2-qubit Bell state. Our inputs are fixed to zero. Both qubit, both qubits are fixed to zero. We're going to apply a Hadamard transformation on the first qubit, and then we take C naught of the first qubit and the second qubit. First qubit being the control qubit, and second qubit being the target qubit. And the output is a Bell state. Okay, if we start with the zero, 0, and we apply Hadamard transformation on the first qubit, so we start with zero, 0, and at this stage we have 1 over square root 2, 0, plus 1 over square root 2, 1. So this is, the first qubit gets into a superposition with plus phase, and then second qubit is just zero, right? This is the second qubit, it remains the same. But then this is equal to one over square root two, zero, zero, plus one over square root two, one, zero. And then now we apply the C naught transformation. C naught of this state is Well, by linearity, we have C naught 1 over square root 2, 0, 0, plus C naught 1 over square root 2, 1, 0, right? And so here we have uh, C naught of 0, 0 is 0, 0. C naught of one zero is one one. 
Okay, the control bit is one, the target bit is zero, so we flip the target bit. Okay, so then we obtain a bell state. So let's call this capital Phi plus. There are actually four bell states, okay? So, um, so we get different bell states with different inputs. And we get all the orth orthonormal set of bell states uh, when given different inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay, so as an exercise, uh, I encourage you to do that. All right, so we are almost finished with the uh, second chapter, basic quantum theory. But let me summarize the quantum, uh, the postulates of quantum computing. Okay. Summary of the four postulates. Quantum computing. So the first postulate is the state space postulates. State space postulate asserts that the state of an n-dimensional quantum system is described by a unit length vector in an n-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so the state of a qubit is just a unit length vector in a in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, complex inner product space. So let's write that down. The state of an n-dimensional quantum system is described by a unit length vector in an n-dimensional Hilbert space. So this was the first postulate. The second postulate concerned uh, evolution of quantum computation, of quantum systems, evolution postulates. And it states that the state evolution of a closed quantum system is described by a unitary operator, okay? So each computational step is described by a unitary operator. Okay, so for any evolution of, of, uh, of a closed quantum system there exists a unitary operator. Okay. If the initial state is a psi, okay, I suppose that use a unitary operator, and if we apply it on psi at stage t, then at the next stage, at t plus 1, we get another state phi. Okay, so that's how quantum systems evolve. And we saw that uh, unitary transformations preserve inner products uh, that is, it preserves the isometry, the geometry of the vector space, and they are invertible, okay? So geometrically also, each unitary transformation can be seen as a rotation of the vector space. And third, we have the composition of systems postulate. which says that um, combined systems are represented by tensor products. So this is 
this is when we want to form n qubit systems where n is greater than 1. Okay, and last we have the measurement postulate. And in fact, we asserted a different variations of uh, measurement postulate. Uh, but um, essentially what it says is that um, if if we are given an orthonormal basis of basis states, okay, phi i, let's say, then it's possible to perform a measurement on a quantum system with respect to basis b, okay, and given Given a general state, psi the um, the result of the measurement is is a number i is a label i with probability magnitude alpha i squared and it leaves the system and the new state of the system will be phi i okay so measurement um, in fact collapses the superposition and it projects um, the system onto one of the basis states of the vector space, okay? All right, so we finished the second chapter, basic quantum theory, and next we will talk about the third chapter, quantum teleportation.